Paul was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, the old King James says, or uh, many of us that were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free. Uh, and so this chapter 3 contains a lot of uh, information uh, that we use quite a bit, but it's always good to see it in the context in which Paul wrote it. Now, do you remember what is the main backdrop or the main thing going on in the background that causes Paul to defend his apostleship in the earlier chapters? Do you remember? Yeah, what we call Judaizing teachers. And what were they all about? You know, teaching, yeah, parts of the law of Moses as if it were still binding. And the best summation of that is in Acts chapter 15. I'll just read these couple of verses as a way of reintroduction to the text of Galatians. But in Acts 15, verse 1, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then down in verse 5, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And then verse 10, Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And so there were those going around teaching that, Parts of the law, like circumcision, were still binding on people today in addition to the gospel. And so Paul, of course, preached against that, that the old law was nailed to the cross and such. And so because of that, uh, and, you know, when people don't like the message, what do they often do? Shoot the messenger, okay, or attack the messenger. And so that's pretty much what they were doing. And so Paul catches wind of this, and, of course, uh, the Galatians were... You know, he says, I marvel in chapter 1, verse 6, that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto another gospel, which is not another, etc. Uh, and so they had vanished away. Now, in this section here, the first section we looked at after introduction uh, was Paul's defense of the gospel uh, based upon his experience. And, of course, um, Paul was viewed by these Judaizers as a Johnny-come-lately that he wasn't really one of the original 12, and so you can't take what he says. He's just a, you know, an apostle wannabe. And so he goes to great length in the first uh, two chapters to show that from his own personal experience, his conversion and such, that there's no way in the world he got his gospel from man, not even the apostles. It was three years, remember, before he first met Peter, and then 14 years when he met again with Peter and the rest and, and those in Jerusalem, and so they spent some time with him. Uh, and so there's no way he got his gospel from uh, man. And so in this section that we began uh, last time in chapter 3, uh, his defense of the gospel based upon Scripture. And what he's, going to, and what he's doing in this chapter is that he is showing, and we're on verse 8 here, he is showing that uh, in the first part of the chapter by, by asking these rhetorical questions, he is showing that their, their whole spiritual state of blessedness right then as he writes was not because of the law of Moses, but it was because of the gospel. And, of course, he mentions the Holy Spirit in here a few times, but uh, that's the reason for it and uh, not the law. So, uh, in essence, you know, why are you so goo-goo over the law or going away to the law when that hadn't done a thing for you, spiritually speaking? And then um, he'll begin in there. So let me just read down one through, uh, uh, down to verse 7. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the word, works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? And therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. All right, and that's pretty important. Those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So it's not by keeping the law... Not by adhering to the law, but it's by faith. And faith came through the gospel, which was given by the Spirit, and uh, the references there, verses 1 through 5. But Abraham was justified based upon faith, and we're going to talk about this. 
And again, uh, who did the Jews look up to the most so far as their lineage and their state of blessedness was concerned? Uh, Abraham, right? Remember, um, you know, um, God, Jesus told the, uh, or I guess it's John the Baptist, that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Uh, you know, we be Abraham's seed, they would always say. And uh, John 8, uh, 33, in their response to, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What do you mean free? We've never been in bondage. We're Abraham's seed, you know. So they would go back to that Abraham seed. And so that's what Paul is doing. Uh, Abraham's seed are not those justified by the law, but they're those who are, based, their justification is based on faith and the promise and such. And he'll develop that as we go along. All right, so this particular point here, those with the faith of Abraham are the ones who are blessed by the seed of Abraham. And again, therefore, verse 7, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And then verse 8, notice the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the, he, the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing or faithful Abraham. All right, and so he, the, the God's promise to Abraham, notice, included the Gentiles um, uh, who were not given the law of Moses. And we'll look at, uh, we'll look more, well, well, we'll look at these right now, particularly, well, look at uh, Genesis 12 real quick. I already had that marked so I can get over there and read that real quick. Uh, in Genesis 12, verse 3, um, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this was God's first uh, promise to Abraham. Then also in 1818, uh, 1818, and we're going to look at Genesis 15 in a little bit more detail later on. But in Genesis 18, 18, since, uh, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And uh, that statement is made there. And so the gospel, and so all nations will be blessed. And actually, you know, what is the meaning? I don't know if I have it right there. Well, notice the scripture preached. Uh, well, whoops, let me go back there. But what is the basic meaning of the word gospel? Good news. Yeah, good news. Uh, the Greek word uh, euangelion has the word eu, which is eu, which is, you know, like euthanasia, euphoria, means good or well. And then uh, angelion is announcement or news. And in fact, when the shepherds were out in the field and the angels came to, uh, to announce the birth of Jesus, uh, the King James says they gave, gave glad tidings of good things. And that word glad tidings is gospel, euangelion, glad tidings. And so the gospel uh, was preached before to Abraham. That is the good news, the glad tidings, that in thee all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And as just a side note here, um, most of the time when Paul uses the word mystery in the New Testament, about five, six times, um, you know, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles coming together. Do you think that was an easy thing for the Jews to comprehend? No, not at all. Gentiles, for that matter, Jews and Gentiles coming together in one body under God. You know, that was, how in the world is that going to happen? And it's through the gospel that that happens. Well, that promise was made way back in Abraham uh, by that statement, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by you. All right, now the scriptures preached is a personification of scriptures. Yeah, the um, the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached. And so the scripture preached, the scripture preached. Um, you know, again, the scripture is being personified as preaching uh, the word there. And of course, it's God that preached through people, but the scripture, his writing, uh, his, you know, his book, we would say, you know, the Bible preached to them, God's word preached. Uh, to Abraham and such. All right, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the Gentiles by faith. Now, foreseeing means to see ahead of time. I have a transliterated Greek word there. The word pro is a prefix there, uh, as it is in preach the gospel before. Yeah, now that word is, is uh, well, I like to mess with words and stuff, but word studies are pretty interesting. But um, you had the first one for seeing, you had the word for see, oraho, and before the word pro, like prologue or prototype, 
Uh, and then for the other one, you have the, the verb, and, and that word preach is the verb form of gospel. You have gospel, then a verb form of it, and then this has the prefix, the verb, uh, verb, verb form of gospel before, okay? And uh, those are pretty interesting prefixes, uh, and so it takes us all the way, you know, when Paul writes this about 50, 51, 52 A.D., uh, it takes us all the way back um, to about 1,000, no, 2,000 or so, anyway, between 1500, 2000 A.D., or B.C., I mean, uh, maybe even further than that. But it takes us way back there. But the very things that Paul is writing here had their seeds way back in Abraham. Uh, and, but yet they are moving away from the promise of Abraham, taking stock and thinking that, that the law is the good, uh, what is where it's at, but it's not. And so to justify means put in a right relationship with God. Uh, to justify the Gentiles. The old King James says that they would justify the heathen by faith, but it means to put them in a right relationship. Now, again, as Paul is talking, in the backdrop of this Judaism, that is just like unthinkable to the Jewish mind of Paul's day. All right, and so the good news preached to Abraham was that in uh, all the nations, including the Gentiles, would be blessed. And again, there's bits of that, you know, in the prophets. I'm thinking of Isaiah 2, uh, verses 2 through 4. And many shall come uh, from the east and the west and sit down, etc. Uh, and so it's all inclusive of even the Gentiles. Uh, even the Gentiles there um, would be included. And notice it's those of faith in verse 9. So then those who are of faith, not the Judaizers, but those who are of faith, they are blessed with faithful or believing Abraham. Uh, and so that's where the blessing is. The faithful are not only blessed in Abraham, but they are blessed with Abraham, um, with believing Abraham. And, um, you know, up in verse 7, therefore, not that th therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And then down there in verse 9, they are blessed with believing Abraham. And so whatever blessings Abraham has... They have it with him. And that, of course, is through the gospel. All right. Well, let's see here. All right. Any questions down there through verse 9? Questions or comments down through verse 9? All right. And, uh, and really, as I mentioned before, um, you know, I've never been tempted to go back to the law of Moses. All right. Personally, myself, you know. Um, but again, there's a lesson in that even for people who have never even been affiliated with Judaism. And that is any system of law, any system of a checklist or any system of, you know, you got to do this in addition to the gospel uh, is not going to work. Because any system like that takes away from the promise of Abraham. Uh -huh. Those people that even profess that the law was still binding, they don't want to even practice part of it. No, they can't. Yeah. Such as yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, and they'll and they'll rightly reason as to why those things don't apply, but they won't use that same standard to the other stuff that they do want. Okay, and you know, same today. You know, if you talk to somebody about instruments and music and worship, mechanical instruments, where do they go first. Psalm 100, you know, or those places like that, you know, which, you know, some of those psalms, the very next verse or two has animal sacrifices in them, you know. Uh, but anyway, it's to Christ where we go, which he's going to say that here toward the end of this. You know, it's Christ is what, who we listen to, not Moses. OK. All right. But uh, this this next point here, justification by meeting the requirements of a law principle is impossible. Uh, notice in verses 10 through 14, for as, for as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by, by, uh, by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, 
that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay? And so meeting a law principle uh, requirements, and again, it doesn't matter if it's law of Moses or any law principle. And what I mean by that is the checklist. You know, you do this, you do this, you do this. Now you are indebted, you know, God has indebted you, or you are indebted, or he's, in, he's debted to you. To, to, you've earned that, in other words, what I'm trying to say there. Uh, is not going to work, uh, but it's by faith, all right? Uh, those who live under the law principle are under the law's curse, uh, because he does say in there in verse 10, you're under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Uh, but the works of the law represent a meritorious, uh, meritorious system of justification. Um, yeah, and so Paul is here contrasting they which, which uh, be of faith with those who seek justification through a law principle. And again, uh, there is law in Christ, uh, Galatians 6, verse 2, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then 1 Corinthians uh, 9 and verse about um, 22 or 24, you know, where Paul says, I become all things to all men that might win some to Christ. And he says, those that are without law as without law, but then he parenthetically inserts, not without law altogether, but under the law to Christ. But Christ's law says it's by faith is the point with all that okay as we'll see here in a moment all right uh and so um as are of the law they who are of the law the esv translates that those who rely on the law in other words again their system of salvation is meritorious meritorious and we'll, we'll talk about all that in a moment um, now one thing we want to point out here that the law is not evil uh, but a system that places God in debt to humanity is evil. Uh, Romans 8, 2, um, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Okay, and um, this is on the back burner also, and one of, my, one of these I'll get to this one day, but you take uh, Romans 7, 8, well, actually 6, 7, and 8, but particularly look at how many how many different laws he mentions there. Law, sin, and death, the law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and uh, all kinds of stuff in there in chapter 7. The end of chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8, and you sort all that stuff out. It's pretty interesting. Uh, but law in and of itself is not evil, but a, a meritorious system based upon that is what is. Uh, and then 1 Corinthians 9, 29, uh, 21 is the one I was talking about where he's talking about the um, law of Christ. And then James 1.25, the perfect law of liberty. And again, all the perfect law of liberty and such. In fact, all those mention law of Christ. With well, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, yeah, notice, law, not just any law, but of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so all those qualifiers point to the gospel, uh, in other words, there. All right, uh, they are a curse. A curse, something a curse is the meaning of that. I can't believe I don't have the cross-reference on that, but I don't, notice, uh, of uh, verse 10, for it is written, uh, cursed is everyone, and that comes from Deuteronomy 27, looks like 26, uh, Deuteronomy 27, 26, it's a quote from the Old Testament, which again, the Judaizers would be familiar with the Old Testament, and so just like Jesus would use the Old Testament against Satan and the temptation there in Matthew 4, Paul is using the Old Testament against the Judaizers to show, to show them that, hey, look, those who are trying to be justified by the law, they're under the law's curse because unless you do the whole law completely, uh, you're going to stand condemned. Notice that typical Jewish uh, scholar and Judaizers of Paul's day uh, thought that common people who had neither knowledge of nor interest in the law were already under God's curse. But it was actually the, Judea, the Jewish scholar and Judaizer who were truly under God's curse. And if you look at John chapter 7, John 7 verse 49. Um, but this crowd that does not know the law is cursed, uh, they cried out. The Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Uh, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. 
And uh, there, um, it was on this occasion that the Pharisees, uh, people sent spies to, to check out Jesus and to accuse him and all that. And the crowd was leaning toward favoring Jesus as they were. And so they cried out, you know, you guys don't know the law and you are a curse. And so that was a common thought. But Paul points out to them that it's actually you guys, you Judaizers, who are actually under the curse. Because you guys are going back to that law and trying to bind that on people. All right. Uh, notice the law itself pronounced a curse upon those who did not perfectly keep it. Okay, there you go. There's the Old Testament uh, passage there. In other words, cursed is everyone who continueth not in all things. You have to be perfect. And that's really kind of what Romans 7 is all about. If you, if you break the law just in one point 20 years ago, it's still got you. Okay, there's no way out of it. Uh, Christ is the only way out of it. You know, O wretched man that I am, chapter 7 of Romans ends, O wretched man that I am, verse 24, I think it is, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so that's the answer, Jesus Christ. But you can't have Christ if you have a different gospel. And that's the whole point he's making here. All right, so to perfectly keep it, continue or abide in. The New American Standard translates that to abide in. It means to remain faithful, to obey, to live in it. Uh, the present tense indicates the need to continue, the need for unbroken and continual observance of the whole law. And what does James say? Remember James 2.10? If we keep the whole law yet offend in one point, we're guilty of the whole thing. And that's right. Uh, guilty of the whole thing. So if you're going to be saved by law, then you've got to live perfectly. Uh, you know? All right? Which no one saved Jesus Christ has done. Uh, and really, that's what Romans 7 is about, you know, and, you know, and that, you just think about it, you know, if I were to ask you, okay, what age is the age of accountability, you know, different and different people, right? But somewhere between there, you have sin, but you don't have a clue of the impact of that sin until later. But later, it's too late to go back, do anything about it. And even if you knew it then, you couldn't do anything about it if you're just strictly by law. Okay, and so that's, that's, but that's where you are, the Judaizers are with the law of Moses. You know, you can't keep it perfectly. Any law system, meritorious, all right? And so verse 11 and 12 then, justification by the law principle and justification by faith are total opposites. Uh, again, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And so no combination of these principles is, uh, of these principles for salvation yeah, it is possible. And if you hold your finger here and look at Romans 4, Romans 4, uh, 2 through 5, for if Abraham was justified by works, all right? Now, of course, we, we do have to point out that works, you know, some works are included in salvation, some works are excluded from salvation. But these works that he is talking about are works, verse 1, according to the flesh. They are works of the law. They are works of meritorious systems, uh, for justification. So if Abraham was justified by works, he has, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Notice he believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. And um, in other words, righteousness is not attainable by oneself. That's why it has to be accounted to him. Uh, I think the, uh, does the old King James have imputed, maybe imputed or something like that? Um, but it has to be, has, we have to be made righteous by something other than us. And that only other, something other is God, of course, through the gospel, through Christ. Uh, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And that term is accounted tells us it's not earned. Uh, we don't earn it. Uh, we can't pay it back in that sense. Um, but it's given, it's accounted, it's put to our account uh, by God. But it's based upon faith, not keeping the law of Moses or a meritorious type system. Uh, the law itself said that the righteous live by faith, not by law. And of course, Habakkuk uh, 2 verse 4, the just shall live by faith. 
uh, that was said in the backdrop of Babylon coming to destroy Jerusalem. But don't worry about it because the just shall live by faith. The faithful will survive, uh, survive that because the just shall live by faith. Uh, and that is repeated three times in the New Testament, one of which is right here in Galatians, uh, as we've looked at here. Uh, the second time is in uh, Romans 1.17, For therein the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then also in uh, Hebrews 10.28, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him as a Hebrew writer is encouraging them to stay faithful to God. All right, but the just shall live by faith. All right, and then uh, the law principle is not the same as the faith principle. Uh, the law itself said that the one who is to be justified by the law principle must, must keep it perfectly. We've looked at that. Uh, justification then is either by the law principle or it is by the faith principle, but it cannot be by both. Uh, it cannot be by both. And so it's either one or the other, which again, when you go back to those questions that Paul asked in the beginning of Galatians 3, you know, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? That's basically what he's saying there. It can't be, it has to be one or the other, and you know it's not by the law. Therefore, you know, wake up, it's by the gospel. All right, notice Christ is the answer to both the law and justification by faith. In uh, Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so Christ redeemed us. He took upon himself that curse for us because he did live a perfect life. He did live uh, righteously. Um, and, and, so it's, and so because he lived righteously doesn't necessarily mean he deserved uh, his position, but what is the only thing that messes up our position before God? Sin. And so if a person doesn't sin, he's not messed up before God. He's not in need of salvation. And so Christ was, did that. In all points, Hebrews 4.15, tempted like we are, Yet he was without sin, and so he redeemed us. And the word redeemed, uh, set free, uh, to buy out of the marketplace, uh, to ransom from slavery. And in a lot of contexts, it's the idea of to buy, you know, to ransom one, to buy one his freedom, to ransom him, him out of slavery. Um, we used to have, you know, back, I don't, uh, well, I guess people use coupons, don't they, nowadays? But, you know, redeem your coupons. And uh, I caught the tail end of that, I think, about the uh, green stamps. Y'all remember the green stamps, you know? You fill up the books, then you redeem them. But you used to read that, that word redeem all the time uh, in connection with that. And I don't, I don't know that we use redeem much like that anymore. But uh, that's what it meant, to buy back. Um, and so Christ became the curse for us. Again, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, is where it says, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And uh, Jesus did hang upon the cross. Uh, having become or being made a curse for us, again, Jesus took our place. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made, actually the King James, I believe, says he made him to be sin who knew no sin. And I believe the New King James may even have there a sin offering. Uh, for he made him who knew no sin uh, to be sin for us. No, the New King James doesn't, but some of them do. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does it take for us to become the righteousness of God? It takes his sacrifice. And again, shows us that we cannot obtain righteousness on our own. It has to be granted to us by God through faith. Okay? Well, of course, righteousness has two meanings, and we'll, we'll come across that eventually. But the righteousness we're talking about here, we can't get on our own. All right? Uh, and then the curse of sin being born away by an innocent sub uh, substitute is illustrated well by the scapegoat. And I meant to do a sermon on this, but, I'm so, but the problem is I just can't keep up with the calendar. I meant to do a sermon on Veterans Day, but man, man by the time it, you know, can't do much about that. But uh, back in late October, early November, you look on your calendar and you'll see Yom Kippur. You know, Yom Kippur. And that literally means Day of Atonement. That's Hebrew for Day of Atonement. 
Um, and so that's a tremendous lesson right there. But you remember, I'll just summarize it. Uh, before the priest could go in and offer uh, blood for the, for the sins of the people, he had to go in and offer blood for his own sins. And then when he came out to get the, the um, sacrifice for the sins of the people, remember there were two goats. One he slayed and took that blood in and sprinkled it before the mercy seat. Uh, and then the other one, he would lay his hands on it and, in essence, transferring the guilt of the sins of the people to the scapegoat, and then it would be released in the wilderness. In other words, God would deal with that. He would take care of that. And that had to be done every year. Well, Christ is the fulfillment of that. Uh, that scapegoat, God will deal with it. Well, that's how God dealt with it right there uh, through the cross of Jesus Christ. All right, now, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree does not mean that a person was necessarily cursed by God just because he was crucified, but death by crucifixion was an outward sign in Israel of being cursed by God. And, you know, the, um, you know a lot of times when bad things happen, people think, well, he deserved that. That's God coming down on him, which sometimes that is the case even today, uh, but sometimes it's not. Well, you know, to, for a person to be crucified, that was looked upon as man cursed by God. Now, I'm sure Jesus wasn't the only innocent person to be crucified, but he was the only innocent God man to be crucified for sure. Um, you know, innocent people get put to death, I don't know about all the time, but, you know, it's not unheard of for sure. All right? But he was not just man upon that cross. He was God on that cross. And in no way even remotely even come close to even thinking about deserving death on the cross. All right, Christ becoming a curse accomplishes two, a twofold fulfillment of Abraham's promise. Uh, justification comes to the Gentiles, and the promise of the Holy Spirit comes to all through faith. Uh, notice again in verse 14 uh, that the blessing, and the word that, um, in the Greek word behind that, introduces a purpose clause, a, a, or actually a, 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 in, order, in order that, not a purpose, well, I guess it's still purpose, in order that. Uh, in fact, some translations may even have an order that. But you have two in verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All right? Now, we mentioned the Spirit earlier in the questions there in verse um, 3. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? Uh, verse 2, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith? And then verse 5, therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you. Uh, and so he does mention that earlier, but here that we might receive this promise of the Spirit through faith. All right? And we've talked a little bit about that, but it, uh, of course justification comes to the Gentiles. We'll deal with that first. And of course the gospel was preached before back in verse 8. We looked at that. And then the Spirit, notice in point 1 there, and we've, we looked at this before, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. But the context and total teaching of the Bible indicates that the promise of the Spirit is the Holy Spirit Himself rather than a promise given by the Spirit. And again, um, well, through faith is obedience to the gospel is the only way that the Christian can receive the Spirit. I thought I mentioned that explicitly there, but I didn't. But, uh, you know, all that saying that we said before, there's no denying that Christians have the Spirit of God indwelling in them. You know, you have to just to, to deny just plain passages of the Bible to say you don't. Now, how the Spirit indwells, there's where open for discussion. And as long as our view does not violate plain Bible passages or principles, it shouldn't be a matter of fellowship, okay? Uh, but here's, here's the one such passage that does say that the Spirit of God is in Christians. Now, you know, uh, some would try to limit it to the first century Christians during the days of the miraculous. Uh, but I don't think that fits the context of this passage or other passages. Um, you know, some passages it does seem to indicate that. But this one right here is right parallel with uh, the, um, the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Well, do the blessings of Abraham still come on the Gentiles? Of course. And so I would say then that the Spirit still is a promise through faith. Uh, but again, you know, the how is open for discussion. All right. Uh, any questions up through verse 14? All right, verse uh, 15 through 18, the promise was given to Abraham to be fulfilled through his seed. To be fulfilled through his seed. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it, be conf it, if it is confirmed, no man annuls or adds to it. 
Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the law which was 430 years later cannot, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it, should be, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance of the law, uh, for if, if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And so again, the promise was given to Abraham, and it was to be fulfilled through his seed. And again, the Jews and the Judaizers are thinking they're the seed of Abraham, but they're really not because they are trying to base their salvation on the law, not on faith. All right, God's promise to Abraham cannot be changed. Uh, and again, even from a human standpoint, and I never could figure out why this was, but anyway, uh, a last will and testament cannot be altered after it's put into effect. Um, but that's just the way it is, okay? And what I mean by that, I don't understand why that is. You know, if someone requests some really, I'll say stupid thing, you know, amongst 18 years old and upward, to be done after his death, you know, who says we got to do it? I mean, you know, if it's like, you know, um, you know, scatter my ashes on top of the Empire State Building on October 31st, you know, whatever, you know, you know, okay, you <laughs> know, all right. But anyway, um, you know, but legally, you know, the will that when we die and we, you know, that once we die, that's it, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no use at all while the testator lives. Yeah, in fact, I'm getting right there. Yes, sir. But uh, notice he says, I speak after the manner of men. And the ESV translates that. I give a human example. And again, uh, I came across this. A Gentile convert could not fathom making a last will and testament. And that should be God making a last will and testament because it requires God's dying. In other words, if you compare that, you know, are you saying God died? Well, yeah, there is a sense in which God died, and we'll talk about that. We'll probably run out of time now, but the word covenant, of course, is testament, and both uh, covenant and will, and we'll talk about more on this later, but in other words, his, his covenant uh, was, was more than just a human covenant. But Paul's point here is to illustrate the unchangeableness of it once the testator dies, which is what the Hebrew passage is all about, and we'll talk more about that later. But once in effect, a human last will and testament is unchangeable. Uh, it's confirmed, and that word confirmed there means put to effect. Uh, cannot annul or disannuleth. The old, uh, the, look at the New American Standard translates that. You cannot set it aside. You know, there's legally binding there. Uh, and we'll, this will be a good place to pick up on next time, the uniqueness of God's covenant with Abraham. Uh, it was not, again, it was not like just a, a man's covenant between men, but it was something even beyond that. And the way it was confirmed is also very interesting. You'll see there was some blood involved in that. And uh, we just don't have the time to get into that now. But any questions or comments up to this point as we look at this? And again, um, any system of law, any system of adding to God's, to the gospel uh, applies to this. And we live in an age now, and of course there's, there's so many extremes. Wow, just incredible. Uh, it's incredible what members of the church actually believe and teach and think is all right. It just blows my mind. But part of that uh, does have to do with the same principles that we find here in Galatians 3. Um, and we'll talk more about this, this covenant here uh, in due time. All right, appreciate your attention.